sophomore year of college, I walked into philosophy of the mind, an upper level philosophy class that I desperately wanted to be in. It was a long shot because it would likely be full of upperclassmen, but I was hoping to sit in on the first class and then sweet talk the professor into letting me in. The classroom was packed beyond capacity with people sitting on the floor and in the aisles. Before he even started addressing the syllabus, the professor let us know that he would not be accepting any sophomores into his class. At that point, a few people stood up and walked out, but not me. I stayed right where I was, in awe, because the 26-year-old philosophy PhD candidate who stood before me was more perfect than any other professor I had seen at the university, and I just wanted to be in his presence. He was sort of handsome and awkward and nerdy and made bad jokes, and I loved him. <laughs> He told us that he and his wife just had a baby. I would later find out that this was a lie. Probably one he felt he needed to tell us because we were at a Catholic university and he thought he couldn't tell us that he knocked up his ex-girlfriend and they had a bastard child together. <laughs> Even though it was fairly liberal as far as Catholic universities go, he kept the facade up while at the university. I sat through that entire class told my roommates all about this hot professor, and vowed to take any other class he taught, no matter the subject. The next semester, he taught Intro to Logic, which I needed for my major, but it was also considered one of the easiest philosophy classes, so it was full of student athletes trying to check off their philosophy requirement. Because of this, I easily became his star student just because I was the only one who did my homework or seemed to be listening to him at all. <laughs> I tried to make up an excuse to talk to him after every class, and he seemed to enjoy the attention almost as much as I did. We would leave class engrossed in conversation, and he would walk me back to my dorm, which was frustratingly close to the classroom. <laughs> Uh, how I wished those walks were longer! <laughs> I began to fantasize about something more happening between us, but I was such a prude, and I still thought he was married, so I knew I would never act on it. Also, the semester was coming to an end, and with it, our time together, because he was transferring to a different university. I was devastated. One night, when I was drunk, I Facebook friended him, and he accepted. I quickly studied everything on his profile, including his wife and daughter, and that's when I learned that they weren't actually married, had never been married, and were no longer together. She lived across the country with her daughter. Meanwhile, my professor seemed to actually be into men. <laughs> These realizations were shocking, but they did not deter me. <laughs> I checked in on him obsessively through Facebook. <laughs> To be clear, we have never directly communicated since he left university other than Facebook likes and happy birthday wall posts, but I feel like I know everything that's going on in his life. Like the fact that a few years ago, a sandwich shop at his new school named a sandwich after him. It's falafel balls and fatouche salad on naan, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Damn it! Why hadn't I thought to name a sandwich after him? <laughs> Sometime, the year after he left, I discovered his YouTube account. This was the first year of YouTube's existence, and I think we were all still learning what it was. <laughs> we probably thought it was way more private than it turned out to be. <laughs> Because he now lived across the country from his infant daughter, he would record daily YouTube videos of himself in a dark room, 
his face illuminated only by the glow of his computer, talking to his daughter, having a one-sided conversation about his day, asking her questions about hers. He read books to her, and at the end of every video, he would poorly whistle directly into the camera for about two minutes. <laughs> I knew I was being a creep. I was intruding on this most private and heartbreaking aspect of his life. There was something so depressing about the way he whistled the itsy bitsy spider alone in the dark. <laughs> He was so far away and so desperate to connect with his daughter. I wondered if his ex actually showed their daughter all these videos. I wondered if he wondered that too. I hope she watched them. I don't know why I kept watching them because <laughs> they, they made me so sad for him. <laughs> but <laughs> I watched almost daily the rest of the year <laughs> and part of the next. <laughs> Every now and then, one of my roommates would sneak up behind me. What are you doing? <laughs> Is that your old philosophy professor? Are you video chatting with him? Can he hear me? <laughs> it was embarrassing. <laughs> Even more so when I had to admit that I was just watching videos of him, and no, he hadn't made these videos for me, and no, he had no idea that I was watching them. <laughs> so why am I watching these? Am I a terrible person who enjoys watching other people's lives derail? Do I love the thrill of watching him when he doesn't know I'm there, like some kind of real-life version of The Truman Show? Am I irrationally lusting after an unattainable gay authority figure because he once showed me an ounce of kindness? Is this the creepiest thing I've ever done? Is this how other people behave on the internet? If he really is as sad and lonely as these videos make him appear, why don't I reach out and talk to him? Would he be weirded out if I did? Am I also sad and lonely? I eventually stopped watching the daily bedtime videos. <laughs> or he stopped making them. <laughs> and now I only occasionally check in on him on Facebook. <laughs> His daughter's going to be 10 this year. <laughs> they discontinued his falafel ball sandwich. <laughs> and he looks happy. Thank you. <laughs>